Everyone should be on mute. I'm Shay Veeman. I'm a chair of the Coral Restoration Consortium's Monitoring Working Group and an ecologist with NOAA's National Centers for Coastal Ocean Science. Welcome to the Coral Restoration Consortium's webinar on photomosaics as a tool for monitoring coral restoration success. This webinar is hosted by the Nature Conservancy's Reef Resilience Network. We've got a great lineup of speakers today on this exciting topic. Stuart Sandin, Art Gleason, Nicole Peterson, Alex Newfield, and Lisa Karn. I'd also like to take a minute before we get started to thank those people who've helped behind the scenes to make this webinar happen. Caitlin Listick, Sherry Wagner, and Liz Shaver at TNC, and Tali Vardy with NOAA and the Coral Restoration Consortium. Before we begin, I'd like to go over a few housekeeping items. First, this webinar will be recorded and available online via the Coral Restoration Consortium and Reef Resilience Network web pages. Today's webinar will be two hours. This will be a, there will be a question and answer period at the end of the presentation, followed by an opportunity for additional Q&A online on the Reef Resilience Network forum. There will be instructions for that um, later on in the presentation. There are two ways you can ask questions during the webinar Q&A session at the end. You can use the question box anytime throughout the webinar to send questions and we'll keep track of those for the end of the presentation. Or you can raise your hand during the Q&A session of the webinar and we'll take your question during that time. You can raise your hand by clicking on the small hand icon on the toolbox to the left of your name. If you're having technical difficulties, such as trouble hearing or seeing the slides, you can send us a message via the same question box and we will try to help you resolve the issue. Also, we want feedback from you during this presentation. There will be several polls during and after the presentations and we appreciate your input in advance. Okay, let's get to it. Um, as context for this webinar and why it's happening, here's some information on the Coral Restoration Consortium and its monitoring working group. The Coral Restoration Consortium was established in 2017 and has expanded from a Caribbean focus to a global reef focus. One of the CRC objectives is to promote information exchange between restoration practitioners, scientists, and managers. To this end, the CRC identified different subject level working groups and restoration monitoring is one of these groups. The monitoring working group is currently working on four efforts shown here, um, including best management practices for monitoring coral reef restoration, um, where is coral restoration occurring globally, um, a spatial database, uh, an evaluation tool for determining the success of restoration programs, and applications of emerging technology for restoration monitoring. I'll walk through a couple of these very briefly to show how this webinar relates. Um, so we're working on a developing a best management practices document for monitoring restorations. On the left, you can see metrics that are considered universal or applicable to all coral restorations, such as information about um, coral populations and landscape change, colony level genetic diversity. On the, on the right are metrics that apply specifically to certain different restoration goals, such as ecological restoration, socioeconomics, restoration in response to events, climate change mitigation and research. Photo mosaics are a tool that can be applied to quantify many of these different goals and you'll see more about that during this webinar. Sticky mouse. Uh, here's a very brief example. In the center image, we can identify the location of specific corals with the red dots, the area of the restoration shown with the orange um, line, um, the species size and health status of the corals to the left and height over here to the right. You'll get far more information later in the webinar from our speakers on this. The uh, monitoring working group is also working on a spatial database to help coordinate with what groups are doing, what restoration where. This also links back to the best management practices as a way to help with data organization. We've developed a prototype for the Caribbean. It's in review by the CRC steering committee and will be available globally once it goes live. Many thanks to those of you all who have helped with the development of this database and keep your eyes out in the CRC newsletter for more information and for a data call as we get going on it. And finally, um, applications of emerging technology for restoration monitoring, which is why we're all here. Today's webinar um, is focused on diver-based imaging. 
We're also planning a webinar sometime in late 2019 on larger area imaging via remote sensing. Uh, let's see. If you're interested in learning more about these um, CRC working group efforts or contributing to them, here is the contact information for the lead of each effort. Shout out to all of those folks for their hard work for this. To find out more about the Coral Restoration Consortium itself or to get involved, here's the website. You can also contact, contact Michelle Lowe for more information or for further information about the monitoring working group. Check out the website or you're welcome to contact me. Now let's dive into photo mosaics. We will first hear from Stuart Sandin from Scripps Institution of Oceanography. All right. Thank you, Shay. Um, good afternoon to everybody who's facing the Atlantic and the Caribbean. Uh, good morning to those of us who are facing the Pacific Ocean. And for those of us that uh, may be in the Pacific Ocean, uh, well, good whatever time of day you may be watching this uh, online in the recorded video version. Uh, we're looking forward to this presentation today to share information uh, perspectives and case studies about the use of photo mosaics for monitoring in coral reefs. With the expansion of readily available technological tools like digital cameras and fast computers, we have capabilities for underwater monitoring that weren't accessible uh, in the recent past. We have a great group participating today and let me first introduce you to them. So from Scripps Institution of Oceanography, we're, we're going to have uh, myself and Nicole Peterson. Uh, Art Gleason is joining us from the University of Miami, who will be exploring the context of photo mosaic uh, for underwater research. And then Alex Neufeld and Lisa Karn are going to be uh, presenting case studies, the application of uh, photo mosaics in the, uh, specifically for coral restoration efforts. Let me start with the beginning, which is what are the goals of photo mosaics? I think most everybody who's online here has some interest in corals and coral reef landscapes. We think about it from the organism level up through the landscape level. Much of the data processing that we have uh, focuses on the smaller scale, and many of the data streams that we're interested in are at the landscape level. What photo mosaics provide us an opportunity to do is to link those scales, is to look at the smallest scale, but then to contextualize them into a larger landscape view. Photo mosaics are a way to create a, a digital archive, a reference of what things look like underwater. And they provide us an ability to inspect through using tools of virtual reality, what is underwater, uh, not in the field while we're dry, while we're in the laboratory looking in a computer. Well, there are a lot of ways that we as a community have been looking underwater, trying to map what the bottom of the ocean uh, looks like. These tools can be grouped into maybe three different categories, bouncing sound off the bottom, sonar-based technologies, bouncing laser light off the bottom, LIDAR-based technologies, and then just depending upon light bouncing off the bottom and trying to get uh, a view of what's there using imagery. As a, a basic overview of these technologies, we've presented a table here, and I should say that these slide materials will be made available later on. One thing I wanna point out is that when we think about the different technologies for underwater mapping, we have multiple considerations. I want to draw your attention to the uh, three of those, those um, characteristics. The first has to do with resolution. This is a, a critical issue for many of us when we're trying to consider what we want to quantify underwater. Technologies that are uh, trying to map something from very far away are going to have different resolutions than being right up next to what's on the bottom of the ocean. We can use tools that are that, uh, from remote sensing and such but there are gonna be trade-offs for aerial coverage versus resolution, as you can see. There's also different data streams that are coming through. A lot of the tools that we have for underwater mapping focus simply on the, the bathymetry and provide high-resolution maps of the 
call it bumpiness or the structure of the bottom of the ocean. Using light-based approaches where we're recording that through photographs, we're able to capture more of what we could call texture or color. That's what we typically think of. We can do that in our typical bands or we can do it with multi or hyperspectral approaches. What we're gonna be focusing on here is the last line in this table, the underwater imagery. As it stands today, and as the technology is being deployed, uh, the underwater imagery provides us with two important characteristics. The first is that you have an ability to resolve very fine features. As we all know from underwater photography, we can, we can capture a photograph that will have the potential of millimeter or even sub-millimeter resolution. We also have an ability with, with underwater photography uh, to capture imagery from a variety of landscapes and from a variety of angles. This is where we're gonna be focusing today. We're gonna to be using the term photo mosaics. And for the purists in the room, I want you to realize that we're using this as a, an overview term. Photo mosaics, when properly defined, are uh, the simple uh, tiling together of mul multiple photographs two-dimensional photographs to create a larger area representation also in two dimensions, as you'll see in the, the top panel there. If you're looking for an analogous technology, think of the uh, digital cameras today or smartphones that can do uh, um, panorama photography. That's using, uh, in essence, a photo mosaic technology, stitching together subsequent photographs. There's also an approach with the, with the growth of um, an acceleration of computers to, to reconstruct three-dimensional representations of objects by taking photos from multiple angles. This is called a, a process of uh, structure from motion. And the whole notion is if you have an object that doesn't move and you take a photo from multiple angles, you can create a three-dimensional reconstruction, a virtual access point. With that, you can look at that, that three-dimensional model from a particular angle, say from the top, as you see our little squirrel here, and that far right version of the squirrel is what could be called an ortho projection, but we'll call here a photo mosaic. This is the technology that we're gonna be talking about in application underwater. Well, why are we doing this stuff? Uh, we, we are trying to capture information about the biology the ecology, uh, the populations of individuals living on the bottom of the ocean. We know that we've been doing this for some time as a community. The methods of, of uh, benthic assessment are varied, but we can think of them in three groups. The line or point intercept transect, the photo quadrat, and then this photo mosaic. Line or point intercept transects uh, look for uh, are typically diver, uh, in situ methods, uh, laying a line and looking for what objects are underneath it, recorded in situ by an in situ observer. Photo quadrats became, became much more popular as uh, photography got cheaper, the advent of digital cameras, and allows us to capture, again, representative spots like these light blue rectangles that are within the big, uh, the big square here. Uh, you can get individual representations of chunks of the bottom of the ocean and then look at those things after the fact inside of a computer. Photo mosaics take the photo quadrat idea and just simply make it into a larger landscape view. The photo mosaic allows us to capture the same resolution as an individual photograph, uh, but now to see that in a, a context that can span uh, tens of meters, hundreds of meters, really the technological limits um, are only set by uh, our operational efficiency right now. For those of you concerned about it, are there differences between the methods? Uh, plenty of studies have gone out there looking for whether uh, estimates of percent cover, coral size distributions, or even structural complexity differ between diver in situ methods uh, photo quadrat methods or photo mosaic methods. Suffice to say that the, the, these studies have demonstrated the parity that the, the uh, diver in situ methods and photo quadrats uh, reveal similar data as the photo mosaics. 
we can alert you to uh, more detailed uh, studies on this. But the point of the matter here is we have good views just of larger areas using the photo mosaic. So if we want to survey for ecological characteristics, the data stream is, is analogous. But there are some opportunities that are afforded by having a landscape level view. I think most of us spend time in the water and recognize that by looking across broader landscapes, we see different features than by focal views of individual points or individual meters squared. As a, as a loose uh, view of the data types that come out of each of the methods, we have this table here. If we're interested in elements of percent cover of the bottom or coral health, looking at colony or area specific uh, characteristics, all these methods work with, uh, similar, with similar, uh, efficacy. Photo quadrats can, uh, reveal a little bit more information because of the time that, that we can now spend, uh, looking at this plot when we aren't underwater, when we aren't worrying about some of the operational details of being underwater. Photo mosaics, uh, provide some additional flexibility. Photo mosaics, because of the larger landscape, allow us to look for uh, individual colonies or features that are bigger than the scale of typical photographs. That allows us to, uh, to develop stronger size distribution uh, um, estimates. Further, photo mosaics are, provide a, a pretty straightforward approach for collecting time series data. You can collect this, the photo mosaic on top of the spot where you collected earlier imagery, and you can now look for change. That change, like accelerating time underwater, allows us to watch growth, mortality, and other rates happening underwater. Finally, by taking multiple perspectives and generating a three-dimensional view, we can get estimates of structural complexity from the imagery here. There are caveats, of course. I'm not trying to pretend that photo mosaics address everything, and as much as uh, you can have a virtual representation of a landscape underwater with a photo mosaic, we can't capture everything. There are things such as occlusions. Occlusions are simply areas where you didn't take a photograph. If you have an overhang and it's not in your photographs, you're not going to have it in your photo mosaic. Of course, so there are options like these panels down below where we can think of ways to minimize the importance of these uh, shortcomings. Moving objects. I did note that, that these approaches are trying to tile together multiple photographs. And if things move, it, it provides computational challenges to make a seamless reconstruction. Resolution is always the key, and we'll hear more about this in the subsequent uh, presentations. If an image doesn't contain the information, in terms of resolution, the photo mosaic won't contain that information. And then finally, there's, this imp there's the importance of three-dimensionality. I did note that we call these three-dimensional reconstructions or the photo mosaics being three-dimensional, but they aren't truly three-dimensional. Three-dimensional is what we get with x-rays. Uh, we are not seeing inside of objects, instead we're seeing the surface. As we talk about the photo mosaics and as we're gonna present it here today, we've broken the, the, the process into uh, four different steps of a pipeline. You'll see that the, the image-based products can be quite attractive and they have some uh, data-based power, but there are some computational and engineering specifics that go into the development of this. We're gonna to try to break it down into these four characteristics. We think of the pipeline in these steps. The first is image acquisition, collecting the imagery in the field. The second is creating that larger landscape view, either through mosaicing or the three-dimensional reconstructions. The third is getting the ecological data out. That is our endpoint and that is our interest. And the last is dealing with our data. If we don't remember to handle these data, uh, we're not going to have that, that virtual access for time moving into the future. Let me dig into these three, introduce them, and then the, the following speakers will use this structure uh, to describe each of the different insights. Image acquisition. If we think about how we collect imagery for photo mosaics, there are a few rules of thumb. Some I've already alluded to. 
If you don't have a photograph of something, it won't show up in the larger scale view. The second has to do with how we collect the imagery such that we can create a larger landscape view. You can imagine that if you do want a broader representation of what's happening underwater or of any landscape, you have to have overlap. You have to know which photograph is linked to which next photograph. We use a rule of thumb that subsequent photographs should have about 80% overlap from image to image. With digital photography, this is uh, fairly straightforward. And the last is to recognize that if you just take photos, two-dimensional photos, single two-dimensional photos underwater, there is no scale. You don't know how big anything is. You only know how relatively big they are. We'll be talking a lot about introducing scale into the imagery to make sure we know how big different features are. The next step of the pipeline is model construction. This is a computer assisted technology today, and it's one that is, is a feature that's growing very rapidly. We can thank the, the rise of digital imagery, and we can also thank the rise of uh, online and uh, at home video games for making this possible. Computers have gotten very much faster through time. That allows us to create these models with, with a fairly reasonable set of computer infrastructure. We need software, we need a computer, and then we need to have some way to manipulate the images or our output products. We'll talk about some of these specifics in the next modules. This is the point that I think we all want to get to, taking a, an image and extracting data. This is why we're all here. We're not the Image Restoration Consortium, but the Coral Restoration Consortium. So gathering data from this imagery is the, is, the, is the principal goal. To do this, we need to find ways to manipulate the imagery, uh, to find ways to identify features, and then find ways to measure them and extract them. Think of this step as a way of doing our field work, like we may do underwater, except doing it in, in silico, as it were, doing it in a computer. Virtual access to coral reefs is now enabled with landscape level imagery and it provides this wealth of opportunity for data extraction. The final step, and I'd say an invaluable step, especially in this day, uh, at this point in time with the status of coral reefs globally, is making sure that we manage our data well. You'll see through examples, and you've likely seen from other uh, uh, presentations elsewhere that large area imagery, that photo mosaics provide a very uh, um, charismatic view of coral reefs. They're representing what coral reefs look like today in 2019. And imagine the value of those data in 2029, 10 years from now. We'll only be able to go back and reference what coral reefs look like this year if we archive what we saw this year. So we're gonna spend some time thinking about the data storage and data access to make sure not only do we uh, share the information that we've collected, but that we also can see through one another's eyes, that we find a way that we can uh, increase the community that we have here through exchange of information and exchange of imagery. From here, we're gonna move on to uh, two different modules. But this is going to be our first of the polling questions that Shay alluded to. What we're going to do now is ask a question and ask you to click and answer. This is going to help us to uh, tailor the question and answer and then to think through uh, forward looking views of how to improve access to this technology for the community that's here. This first question, what is the primary method of reef monitoring that you currently use? Diver based surveys with data sheets? diver-based surveys with photographs, multiple types of monitoring, including photo mosaics, no or very little monitoring. If you don't mind clicking a button now, that would help us out. Okay, as you finish filling this out, we're gonna be handing this over to Art Gleason. Art Gleason's from the uh, University of Miami, 
and has been uh, has dedicated much of the past decade toward the innovation and engineering of photomosaic imaging and processing technologies. Many of you from the Caribbean region and Florida will be familiar with Art, and he'll be providing a perspective of the trade-offs that are implicit to using photomosaic technologies, including some background in, in helping to decide what are the sp uh, specifications that are right for your application. With this, I'd like to hand it over to Art. Thank you, Stuart. I'm waiting for the screen to come back. There we go. Okay, thank you. <clears throat> Stuart just gave an overview of the, uh, the four steps in the photo mosaic processing pipeline. He also pointed out why it's important to think of this holistically as a, as a complete pipeline and not just get hung up on just one of the steps as being more or less important than the others. Um, we've been experimenting, as, as Stuart mentioned, with many of the options on each of these four steps for more than a decade now, and it's become apparent that there are some decisions to be made when setting up a monitoring program using photomosaics. So what I'd like to do in my portion of this presentation is to drill down a little bit um, in detail from what Stuart presented and discuss some of the choices for how you approach these four steps. And my goal here is to share some thoughts on the trade-offs that will be relevant to decisions about, about making these mosaics and using them. So to start with, it's important to recognize there's two things that are absolutely non-negotiable with respect to mosaics. And these are the sharpness of the individual images that you take and uh, their, their overlap, how, how much um, overlap between uh, images there are. Sacrificing either of these will lead to certain disaster because the photos will not be able to be matched automatically by, by the software, and therefore the mosaicing process will fail and the entire exercise is, is sort of pointless. Therefore, other choices we make have to be made with deference to these two priorities, you know, above other things. Here we can see that there are, there are certain choices to be made in each of the four steps of the pipeline. And what I'll do next is go into details on these in a minute. But notice that the decisions uh, on these choices reflect answers to certain questions, some of which I've put over here under the trade-offs heading. And answers to these questions might or, or maybe certainly will differ among different users. So we can expect that different end users may make some different decisions um, on these same choices that we all face. So just um, keep that in mind. And what I'll do now is discuss in order, go, to, go down these sort of um, choices in each of these four steps that we need to decide. Okay, the first thing, one of maybe the most fundamental choice that, that we all face is gonna be what camera to use. This is very basic and there's really no way around it. Everyone who wants to use photo mosaics will somehow need to obtain and use a camera obviously. Uh, it's possible to make mosaics with just about any camera, however, um, as long as you respect the non-negotiable constraints of sharpness and high overlap that I just discussed. Here I'm showing a range of options, starting at, at one end down here with the uh, smaller point-and-shoot or sports cameras. These are smaller, they're easier to carry and swim and transport, um, and they're less expensive than other cameras but they also have lower image quality and a lot less control over settings. So they may be harder in some uh, conditions to prevent image blur. Um, note also that many of these types of, um, of, of lower end or point and shoot cameras don't have built-in interval timers. And um, that, the consequence of that is you're going to need, if you have a camera like that, you're going to need to click the shutter button by hand or rig up some sort of alternate um, system to do that which may, you know, may add a, a level of complexity. In the middle row here, we're talking about DSLRs. These are um, at, the, at a different, uh, another end of the quality spectrum. They're higher image quality, they're easier to control, uh, which makes them easier to get sharp images, easier to use to get sharp images, but they're also physically larger and more expensive. Up here at the top, I've put what, what we're calling the dual SLR option, which is something we came up with um, years ago when we realized that that resolution is really key for, for certain users and certain applications. When you need very high spatial resolution to do things like identify algae or something like that, 
um, if you need the best resolution, this dual SLR system is really the way to go. Finally, uh, over here, I've put some ballpark cost numbers. Um, I, I'm calling these ballpark numbers because, uh, well, it's hard to pin down a specific number uh, unless you really start to go shopping. So here's a couple of points on cost to keep in mind. First, the SLRs seem to be a lot more expensive than, for example, GoPros. But you keep in mind, you do tend to get what you pay for in terms of image quality. Also, the camera is really a small part of the overall field budget. So consider carefully where you want to cut costs. Secondly, costs are variable depending on your situation. So some academics, for example, University of Miami has a big discount at some of the big photo stores uh, that changes this equation somewhat. Uh, another option around this SLR cost barrier is to maybe buy a new housing, but go back one or two generations and get used cameras off of eBay. Um, that's, yeah, that works really well. I know Stewart's Lab does that. And, um, and, and that's a very cost-effective way to go about it. Sticking with the camera for a second, I'd like to show a few comparisons. So um, it's worth showing some consequences of these camera choices. So these are two photo mosaics. They were both made from data acquired simultaneously. So from the same altitude, the same lighting, and uh, both in shallow, like less than three meters water depth. The one on the left was made from GoPro still images set on the medium field of view, which reduces the wide angle distortions that you so often see from those cameras. The one on the right is made from a Nikon D7100. And what you can see at this scale is the Nikon image has, you know, slightly nicer looking colors, um, but not dramatically so. And you can also see the geometry is the same for these data sets. So we're able to actually make mosaics from both of them. So you can't necessarily appreciate the differences between the cameras at the scale of the full mosaic. When you zoom in, however, okay, on the left again, uh, the, the GoPro image at full resolution and on the right, the Nikon, the sharpness and the extra resolution of the SLR is quite apparent. You can tell uh, this Acropora cervicornis in both images, for example, but it's harder to tell, you know, the, the, where a turf algae grades into bare substrate here on the GoPros versus the SLR. Um, this may or may not matter to you, depending on your needs, but it's something you need to decide and you need to keep in mind. Here's an example. Uh, this is another data set acquired simultaneously. Uh, this time at 20 meters depth. On the left, as before, the, Go the mosaic made from GoPro stills. And on the right, the mosaic made from a Nikon D7000. Here, even at the scale of a full mosaic, the difference in color are quite apparently different between the GoPro and the SLR. Um, this data set was acquired with the full dual SLR system. So some real differences are apparent when you zoom in. So uh, here on the left, again, a full res, image from the GoPro and on the right up here in the upper left is a full res image from from the um, one of the SLR cameras the one set at the wide angle and over here uh, the one set at a narrow angle and I think it's it's quite apparent you can see the difference in blurring um, smudging of details which is a consequence of this low light situation and you can see how much additional detail you retain when you have this multiple camera set up. Okay. Once you've decided what camera to use, you need to decide how to move that camera over your survey area. And there's many options here. The main factors to consider are the area you want to cover, the depth that you're operating at, and your and of course your budget. I'm showing here um, in these boxes that the sort of typical areas uh, that can be covered in one dive, say, uh, by each of these technologies. So a single diver can cover an area of, you know, roughly one or two, one or two hundred meters squared in a in a in a typical dive. Um, a diver using an array of cameras, multiple cameras, can cover a larger area in the same amount of time. Um, and uh, and then of course, if you use some other powered technology like an AUV or a towed array or uh, uh, scooters, diver propulsion vehicles, you can cover much, much larger areas in the same amount of time. Um, it's also worth noting that for any of these, you can make, you know, quote unquote, mosaics of mosaics, right? If you need to get even larger areas. 
So you can do adjacent areas as a diver, say, and stitch those um, mosaics, process them separately and stitch them together. I think Alex will show an example of that later on. All of these techno all of these options work fine for mosaicing. You just need to plan for your particular situation. Okay. Part of acquiring data is registering it in space. Okay, uh, there's two components to this. Stuart mentioned um, that photo mosaics, imagery in general, but photo mosaics in particular, do not inherently have scale attached to them. Um, the spatial resolution of the data needs to be added with additional information beyond using just the pictures themselves. One way to do this is with electronic systems, such as uh, inertial navigation or acoustic beacons. Um, this works really well, but it's expensive and, and possibly complicated. My general philosophy has been, if you've got it, use it. So of course, but you know, by all means, if you have an AUV and your AUV has navigation information associated with it, use it. We can use those to, to register and provide scale for mosaics. But for a diver, if you don't have a technology like that, a simpler uh, solution such as putting just scale bars in the image works just as well in terms of accuracy for much less expense. And finally, um, a GPS can be used for larger projects. For example, the toad array that I just showed on the previous slide, um, at least in shallow water. The second aspect of registration is marking your site. So, so you want to be, you know, the power of mosaics is being able to track individual areas over time. So you want to be able to come back and repeat data acquisition at, at a given area. Typically, this is done by installing some sort of marker, like, like a stake or multiple stakes in, in a particular pattern. Here, the trade-off is between initial effort, setting up the first time, and the revisit effort. How hard is it to set up on repeat visits? And of course, redundancy, because stakes do get lost from time to time. So what we've put over here is, are some arrows to help visually um, clue in the, these trade-offs. I want you to, I want to point out this color scheme with the arrows because I'm going to be using this again. The arrow points in the direction of increasing feature, whatever it is, and the color indicates whether uh, it's good or bad. So for example, a low initial effort is good. We've colored that in green, uh, whereas a high initial effort is bad. We've colored that in red. So, you know, keep these color schemes in mind because you're going to see them again on, on the upcoming slides. Okay, once you have the data, you have some hardware and software choices to make in order to process these data into mosaics. On the software side, the main choice is between commercial packages and open source projects. There are several options in both of these general categories. Probably everybody's familiar with making this sort of decision you know, for other types of software, and uh, the factors here are basically the same. How handy are you with programming, installing, and and honestly fixing free stuff that doesn't necessarily have support. If you're into that or you have support at your institution, so for example, uh, an engineer who's a colleague or a graduate student who really loves these, these things, then the open source options could be good choices for you. Um, for most of the people listening to this call, however, it's probably a better bet to go buy a commercial package um, because of the e the ease of use and the support that comes along with, um, with buying a commercial product. The prices for these commercial products are highly variable. So um, your status as an academic versus a federal um, buyer versus a corporate buyer, that plays a role. Volume discounts play a role. And um, I've, I've found that prices also change with time. So I, I can't quote you exactly. I don't want to put prices up here, but I can say that the differences can be a factor of 10 or more, like 500 versus $5,000, for example. So you need to shop around and, and do some research here that pertains to your particular situation. On the hardware side of processing, the basic trade-off is between cost and performance. So a supercomputer here will have a high cost, but it will be fast and let you do large areas at high resolution. Um, whereas a laptop, will be uh, a low cost, but it will be slower and more restrictive on the project sizes that you can accomplish with that hardware. So once you, data extraction, once you have your mosaic made, you need to actually pull out 
some useful information. For quantitative data, the two main methods are point counting. Uh, probably everybody's familiar with that. You put random points on, an, on the image and identify what's under them. And digitization. Full digitization of the image means tracing the polygons around every bit of the benthos and possibly scoring those polygons or otherwise adding attributes such as uh, the percent bleached or, or noting whether there's disease for a coral colony or whatever you're interested in. This is a very labor intensive, but it allows for, for a lot of information. Partial digitization is a compromise uh, between these two extremes, whereby you only digitize the things you're interested in at the time. So say just the corals, for example. The key points here are uh, more information costs more in terms of effort. Ultimately, the needs should drive data acquisition so that you get the correct area or resolution or image quality for the data that you want to extract. So think about that first. Um, rapid progress is being made in terms of automating image extraction thanks to the incredible advances in neural networks and computer vision research over the past couple of years. So soon we should expect the effort involved in this step to decrease. And finally, it should be pointed out that extraction can be collaborative. So this gets back to the partial digitization concept. Say you digitize corals because that's all you need for your interests. But then later on, someone else can come back and do the sponges, for example, or, or anything else. This is possible because all the information is archived in the imagery, whether or not it's extracted at a given time. It does require that you share your data with others, however. So um, we'll come back to that concept more in a minute. All right, so I'm gonna summarize some of these, tra some of these trade offs here. Step one in the pipeline image acquisition. Let's be a little bit more specific with some of the examples of how the choices I just described might translate to trade offs. The issue here is really um, cost versus resolution and image quality. Um, there are definitely situations where the gold level cameras, the dual SLR uh, setup, are absolutely needed. So for when you, need the, when you need the absolute highest resolution possible, or if you're in low light situations, um, that's the way you wanna go. There are other situations where you can get by with less investment in the camera setup. Um, However, as we just described with the data extraction, your camera choices should be dictated by what you want to get out of the data. In terms of model construction, um, the choices are cost versus speed, area, and resolution. It's really that simple. Um, unlike cameras, however, which are very difficult to share, data processing is something that could take advantage of economy of scale, whereby many end users collaborate to share the costs, say, of this gold level processing. Thus, you know, even though the gold level computer will be more expensive in an absolute sense, if you can share that resource with others, the cost per user, say, or per mosaic uh, might actually be less. That's something um, we should consider as, as a community. Step three in the pipeline, data extraction. Uh, as, meant, as I mentioned above, the trade-off here is really information versus cost in terms of labor. Um, I don't have a lot more to say about this right now, except that you should start here. Determine what you want to measure and use that to drive the other decisions. But remember also that uh, to think long-term with these decisions, because what you might want to extract today from the mosaics um, you know, might not be the only thing of value whether or not it's something you, you want to extract later on or, or just have in the archive uh, because it'll be valuable in the future. Okay, and finally, in terms of storage and data curation, an individual user, the bronze level here, can get by with a stack of hard drives and pretty simple organizational scheme. The main issue is just making backup copies. However, there's much to be gained by shifting to the left here towards the gold end of the spectrum. Specifically, if we as a community can cooperate to share storage and access to these data sets, then we'll all have much greater opportunities to fully exploit these data through, you know, for example, different people extracting different things or for making regional to global scale um, use of this data. Much like the hardware trade-offs for processing, the cost to an individual for shifting from bronze to gold will go up, of course, but if we can pool resources, then the cost on a per user or per mosaic basis 
might not actually go up. I don't have an, an absolute answer for, for this today, but it's a problem we're actively working on and we'd be happy to build a dialogue with everyone on this call about how we can best cooperate. Okay. I've been talking about quite an array of choices and trade and and trade-offs here. And I want to be clear that the goal is not to be intimidating uh, by presenting all this information or scare people off with the complexity. In fact, the goal is exactly the opposite. The goal is to help people avoid having to experiment with all of these different trade-offs and to help expand access to this technology by providing some examples and a helping hand. Therefore, I want to conclude this discussion of trade-offs by focusing on what people in the coral restoration community are likely to actually need and how we can help them achieve that. So about two months ago, uh, the Coral Restoration Consortium ran an online poll to help, planning, to help plan for this webinar. And many of you on the phone probably participated in that. Some of the key results are shown here. And as you can see, there was a lot of general agreement con or concordance within the community about what people want. Certainly in terms of the area people want to cover and the depth of sites. Maybe a little bit more variance in terms of uh, the resolution that people want, but in general, a lot of people want more or less the same things. So when I finish, Nicole's gonna take over and explore the depth of the potential for photo mosaics to, to achieve these, um, these milestones or these, uh, these goals that people have identified as what they want. And then Alex and Lisa will follow on with a couple of examples of how these mosaic, photo mosaics were, were used specifically for monitoring restoration areas. Um, Finally, I'm going to close with the point that oh, here, these are other uh, results from the survey, and I'll close with the point that training and cost seem to be the main obstacles people perceive when they're facing um, or considering this photo mosaic technology. We're addressing training issues right now with things like this webinar, publishing standard operating procedures, as well as other opportunities planned for the future. And we're hoping to address cost with these things that I've alluded to in the last few minutes, these community level collaborations. This is still a topic under development, but um, hopefully everyone will be engaged after, the, after this uh, introduction. And so with that, I'm gonna turn over uh, the presentation to Nicole, who's gonna show you in detail the method that the Sandin Lab has settled on as their standard procedure after many years of development and re refinement and considering these various trade-offs. Okay, thank, thank you, Art, that's, that's great. Um, at this point, we'd like to get to the second of our, our polling questions, uh, trying to work out the, the need and scope uh, of the community here. With computational support available, approximately how many photo mosaics would you or your organization be likely to collect each year? We have these as base 10, one to 10, 11 to 100, 100 to 1,000, more than 1,000. All right, thanks everybody for participating. Great. Um, at this point, as Art points out, uh, we're going to hear from Nicole Peterson, who's a researcher here at Scripps working with the 100 Island Challenge. Uh, importantly for the community here, Nicole comes from a biological background, but today serves as the de facto chief technical officer of this project. Uh, the computational and technical side of photo mosaics is, uh, is available to our biological community, and Nicole is going to share insights from the collaborative development that we've had of this photo mosaic pipeline. The work has involved the participation of a diversity of skill sets, engineers, computer scientists, data managers, and of course, biologists and ecologists. Nicole? Thank you, Stuart, for the introduction. Um, so essentially, what I will be talking through is a realized version um, of this full photo mosaic pipeline. So how do you do it? Um, a little bit more of a deeper dive into these details. And um, it's, it's a bit of an example of the workflow that our lab uses here, but I would like it to serve as an example of what's possible. What can you do with this technology 
Um, for each of these steps of the pipeline, as we developed it, we really wanted to ask um, uh, how can we continue to collect uh, as detailed of data as possible, and with each step of the pipeline, not compromise the quality of that data. And so uh, I do want to start with a bit of an example from our lab and a bit of a personal story of what I'm interested in with using these mosaics. And I like to think small. So you see there a small juvenile. So can we find things as small as a centimeter with these images? And I think the power of this technology is to be able to do that um, and find them on a larger scale. So we can see things that are incredibly small on the reef and be able to, at the same time, zoom out and see where those small organisms fall out on this larger landscape. And this is going to give us a lot of insights into these communities and these ecosystems and really expand our understanding of what's happening. Um, and so I think that this method is really flexible in terms of um, the scales that we can approach and think about um, these things. We can look at small scales, we can look at broad scales uh, and understand how things are being distributed. So um, as Stuart and Art have mentioned, this is something that we've been working out and developing for uh, nearly the past 10 years now. Uh, and so um, you'll see examples of, of what we can learn uh, and how we do this work. Uh, and so by using these tools across these broad geographies, um, using these same sets of standardized tools, um, we've created these scalable methods um, so that we can start to gain these insights. So you can take the same methodology, take it from site to site, island to island, and really start to expand and understand um, how coral reefs work. Um, these image-based products are archival and shareable, which creates the opportunity for many people um, or users to go through and use these same data, data sets and essentially like virtually see reef to reef um, island to island, et cetera, so that we can all uh, essentially see through each other's eyes and learn from one another. Uh, and as Stuart mentioned earlier, this is uh, a process that has not been uh, just our group. So we've worked with a variety uh, of engineers, developers, um, coral reef scientists. Um, as an example, the visualizations that you're seeing here was developed by some engineers uh, at UC San Diego as part of the Cultural Heritage Engineering Initiative, uh, in particular, Vid Petrovich and Falco Kuster. And so uh, there's a lot that we can learn uh, from collecting the, this imagery. And I think one of the, the main uses or one of the, the, the big power of using this imagery is that it is archival. So it allows us to revisit these same sites and see them uh, through time. So we can fast forward or rewind the clock to see what these reefs lo look like and understand the changes that are happening within these ecosystems. And so uh, I want to start off with the first step of the pipeline. How do we do it? How do we collect these images? So the first part, is choosing the camera system. Um, as I mentioned earlier, we didn't really want to compromise the quality of the, the data. So we really wanted to, um, as I said, um, collect high quality data across these broad scales. So we settled on this two camera system that we developed with ART, uh, the first of which being a wide angle lens. So this allows us to cover a broad landscape, um, logistically constrained to one dive and at the same time attach a second camera system or a second camera to that system being a, a longer focal length that's more zoomed in that allows us to capture that really high detail so that we can find things like juvenile corals, fish bites, determine um, algal identifications or in areas where you have really high coral diversity start to work out the taxonomy. And so to collect this imagery, uh, we swim at a slow speed, uh, swimming the camera system back and forth. The night that we use do have intervalometers, which allows uh, us to collect an image every second without having to constantly click on the trigger. 
Um, you'll see in the upper right an example of the SWIM pattern that we use. It's basically a double lawnmower approach that allows us to be systematic in that overlap to ensure that we have good coverage of all the features on the reef. We swim at a distance of one to two meters, generally averaging a meter and a half off of the bottom so that we collect imagery at a resolution suitable for the data extraction needs we have later on. At each of these sites, which is generally around 10 meters by 10 meters, we will collect a total of 2,000 to 3,000 images per camera. And as you're swimming, there are a lot of considerations to take in, um, especially for more complex features where you might need to tilt the camera a little bit so that you get um, more of that three-dimensional structure and minimize the amount of occlusions that come out in your model. Uh, and so in setting up the plot, um, there are a lot of referencing that we include. Uh, the main ones being uh, scale bars. So you'll see those in the center, just something or an object of a known distance so that you can reference these models later on and begin to size um, the corals or objects within the photo mosaic. Um, we also include markers at which we collect depths. That way we can uh, give an orientation to the model. So you know whether it's sloping or flat, et cetera, um, and essentially just bound these models so that you know which way is up. If you are considering um, doing resurveys and being able to watch these reefs through time, having some sort of a reference underwater, whether those be stakes or some sort of a permanent marker underwater, um, You'll need to include that in your survey de design. One of the great things about these mosaics is that you have this large image of the reef that allows the, you to see these larger features. So you can essentially take down that image with you underwater and make it really easy to refine a site. Uh, step two of the pipeline is going to be model construction. So how do you put things together? So we use um, a structure for motion commercially available software that's uh, really widely used across the Structure for Motion community, which is Agisoft Metashape, formerly called PhotoScan. Um, for us, it's a low cost because of the good academic pricing, and it's really user-friendly. So you don't need to have a really uh, broad technical background to be able to use this. Um, it's actually pretty easy to use, and it produces these really high quality reconstructions and it's uh, scalable for a large data set. So it allows us to work with these really large image, set, image sets, usually on the order of a couple thousand images and be able to produce high quality models um, with uh, the computer power that we have here. Uh, so what is the computer power that's needed to put together these models? So since we are dealing with really large areas and large image sets, it does require um, these sorts of processing computers, uh, multi-core CPUs, a lot of RAM to be able to handle image sets of that size. Um, and with uh, the programs that are available, a lot of them do leverage the use of GPUs or graphics cards. So adding those to your machines will really help accelerate this process. And so I've given an estimate of the cost. Um, and there are some caveats that this is the cost in 2019 um, and that this is uh, always changing with technology becoming faster and cheaper. Uh, and so a machine such as this uh, at the current moment might cost you around $6,000, uh, uh, but you will be able to process about 200 models of that two to 3,000 um, image data set per year. And so obviously, um, if you use the computer for more than one year, we have that estimate of $30 per model. That's just using it for one year. So if you use it for two years, it'll be 15, um, so on and so forth. Uh, the second part of model construction, so that'll give you a 3D model, but something to consider is um, taking that model and working with it in 2D space, which at the current moment is a lot easier than working in 3D space. So uh, that would be using ortho rectification, which does require that you assign scale to the model. 
and depth referencing so you know which way is up and so that you can define the plane from which you orthoproject. Um, so orthorectification essentially just corrects for perspective and relief. So any object that's closer to you in a perspective view will appear larger, even though it is not. And so orthorectification will correct for that. So when you're thinking about extracting data across um, a model or, or I guess the photo mosaic, um, using the terminology here, uh, you do want to have that constant scale and accurate sizing of all of the features across your image, and that's what orthorectification will do. Uh, and so then we have the third step, which is data extraction. So this is the step that is most uh, human driven. So it is probably one of the more time intensive steps. But this is, uh, for most of us, the most important uh, step of this pipeline. What do we actually want to get out of this imagery? So there are a variety of methods that you can use. Uh, and depending on what particular uh, metrics you have of interest will determine what method you use. Uh, so the first and simple one is just getting percent cover. And this doesn't require the really time intensive digitization. It just requires um, identifying what's under each point. And from this you can get uh, coral cover as well as if you add some additional information to each point and understanding of the health. Another thing that you can do where you'll get a lot more information and, and one of, is one of the advantages of using these photo mosaics is the digitization workflow. And so this allows you to learn a lot more from these photo mosaics. Uh, for example, the size structure, growth in 2D um, for resurveys, percent cover as you would with the point count method, um, coral health recruitment. Uh, as you start to build these maps, of the bottom, an understanding of the competition and spatial patterns of these communities. Uh, by using the structure for motion pipeline, which will generate these 3D models, we can also understand the structural complexity of a reef. Uh, so there's uh, many approaches, this being just one example um, of a simulated point gauge or chain and tape approach. Um, but as you have this 3D model, there is a lot uh, more that can come out of that from Rogosity. And of course, these are 3D models, so you don't, uh, there are opportunities available to do the digitization directly on the 3D model so that we can get more information, um, mainly in sizing things, uh, not just planar area, but actually surface area too, taking the three dimensions into consideration as well. And with all of all of these uh, data extraction or annotation pipelines, they at the current moment they are largely human driven, but there is a lot of machine learning um, being used and developed in order to make this all happen faster. Uh, with the annotation, there's not as much of a computational requirement for how to do this. You just need a laptop that can run uh, image annotation platforms. Uh, for instance, Photoshop, ArcGIS, or ImageDay. I'm sure there are a variety of other programs available to do this. Um, if you are doing digitization, having a pen and tablet makes this a lot quicker than using a mouse. Uh, and really the big limitation here is person time. How much can you um, put forward to actually go through and make these annotations? And finally, we have the data curation and access. So it's really important, especially as you start to scale up the use of these photo mosaics and collect more and more data sets to be really diligent about how you um, reference these models, name these models, so that all of this becomes um, easy to read, understand, and find. Um, with all of these image-based tools, they are archival. So we do want to make sure that we include the ability to search through and find these so that they don't get lost uh, within these large data streams. Uh, in terms of data storage, uh, with all these digital archives, it is really important to always keep back backups of any, any data that you use as hard drives do fail, um, unfortunately. Uh, one big thing is to identify the storage space that's needed for your project size. So uh, with the data sets that we collect, usually around 2,000 to 3,000 images per plot uh, per camera, 
that equates to uh, with all the processing products, the downstream products, about 100 gigabytes per model. Um, and so there are a variety of different storage methods that you can use, whether they be hard drives, uh, these smaller in-house in servers or larger data servers. It's all going to depend on how much um, data you're collecting. Um, these, these costs um, can add up. But uh, these are the cost of storage is quickly becoming cheaper and cheaper, and so these will continue to go down. And one thing to uh, also consider in terms of your data storage options is the reliability and longevity uh, of these storage options for archiving. So data servers and well-maintained data servers are going to be much better at archiving these data long term than a hard drive that's sitting um, in your lab. And so a lot of the um, terminologies that we've uh, shown throughout this presentation, uh, there are some of these acronyms available here, as well as some of the software packages that you can use um, to uh, process these models. Um, and I want to close uh, with um, all of the, the workflow that I've just discussed, um, we are making available uh, with our standard operating procedure. Uh, which it has, I believe, been posted on the CRC website so that you can all take a look um, and learn and understand how to do this stuff so that this whole pipeline can be made more accessible to you. Okay. <clears throat> Thank you, Nicole. That's uh, it's terrific to see the details, and I'm sure that as a, a community of folks uh, interested in expanding use of photo mosaics, uh, digging into details is important. We have our next poll question now. If you're new to the use of photo mosaics for monitoring, what would be your preferred strategy to adopting the technology? Would you want to build all parts of the pipeline in-house? Would you want to collaborate for the processing parts of the pipeline? Would you want to just contract or collaborate just for the data storage part of it? Or both B and C? Please take a moment to fill this out. We appreciate your participation in this. We have the polling moving the right way. Thank you. Okay, great. Thank you all. So we're fortunate enough uh, to have a, a diversity of perspectives here today, uh, talking through the, the trade-offs, some uh, details and manifestations of how this is done. We have two coral restoration organizations represented uh, with the Coral Restoration Foundation and Fragments of Hope in the next two case studies. Uh, as Art identified clearly, there are uh, many choices that every organization uh, can and will make in moving forward to uh, build the technology to their needs. Uh, first up is uh, Alex Neufeld from the Coral Restoration Foundation. Uh, Alex and his team have been very industrious in, in building uh, collaborating and elaborating uh, a, a pipeline for uh, using photo mosaics in the monitoring of their outplant sites. Uh, with this, I hand it over to Alex. Thank you, Alex. Thanks, Stuart, and thanks to everybody else for tuning in and to the presenters for doing such a great job of this so far. Um, it's a pleasure to talk with everybody today about some of the work that's been happening at the Coral Restoration Foundation for the last 18 to 24 months or so. Um, and in a similar manner to what Nicole did, uh, I'm going to be walking through each of the four steps of the CRF uh, uh, pipeline, sort of what we use in-house for our day-to-day -day mosaic procedures. Um, so a little bit of background on the Coral Restoration Foundation, if you're not super familiar with us. Um, we outplant approximately 25,000 fragments of Acropora and Orbicella corals in the Florida Keys every year. 
we are uh, transitioning our in-water monitoring from uh, diver assessments and fate tracking, which worked in the past when we were planting fewer than, say, 10,000 corals every year, um, to a monitoring uh, protocol that is based on photo mosaics. We are no longer really restoring corals. We think of ourselves here as restoring reefs. And so we would like uh, our monitoring methods to reflect that. Um, this upscale and outplanting has shown us that we need to similarly upscale our monitoring and the in-water diver assessments and fate tracking were simply not scalable for us. So we started to develop a photo mosaic program and it's important to note that we knew of the mosaic tech obviously that was out there but we developed these specific techniques to fit our organization's needs and as Stuart and Art have both explained so far uh, there are a lot of trade-offs that each organization is going to have to sort of weigh in determining what they're capable of doing with photo mosaic technology and what they want to get out of it so for our organization we traded some of the resolution that Nicole was just talking about and that they use at Scripps for uh, greater speed, lower cost, greater scale, and more efficiency, as well as a change in metrics from the traditional fate-based tracking. So as I mentioned, our monitoring emphasis as a result has started to shift from the individual colony to the entire reef site. And so, uh, we're now mosaicing areas that range from a couple hundred square meters all the way up to a couple thousand square meters, all with the same in-water procedure that I'll go through here in a minute. So it's important to note first off that um, we want everything in our procedure to be easy to use, scalable, transferable, and very easy to implement. So we use two GoPro Hero 5 cameras, a very simple, very cost-effective setup. And we mount these on a PVC rig approximately two feet apart. The cameras are set to a wide field of view and the built-in intervalometer is set to a one second interval. Uh, on the GoPro cameras, it's referred to as the time-lapse setting. Here's a picture of our PVC camera mount with two attachments. We've used a couple of different attachments in the past. This right here in the image seems to be the best one. Uh, it's a simple screw mount that the GoPro camera underwater housing can simply slide into, and then you're good to go. We also use a couple of different scale bars, a larger square end scale bar here on the top of this image, and then a couple of smaller, uh, just straight scale bars that have tape designations for, uh, for the different sizes of the scale bars. One thing that we've found in our in-water procedures is that it really helps both the diver and the computer uh, if you place these scale bars on the sort of trickier areas of your reef to mosaic. Uh, it helps in giving the computer a nice uh, concrete straight yeah, uh, object in the image to sort of use as a, as a stitching base, and it also helps your diver orient themselves uh, on the trickier parts of your reef site. We've also used some optional materials in the past, including DPVs, diver propulsion vehicles. Uh, these have been used to map some of the larger areas of reef so that you don't exhaust yourself swimming, uh, and we've also used floats to mark different areas of the reef, corner points perhaps, or a transect line uh, in places where the visibility is really poor or maybe you're unfamiliar with the reef site that you're mosaicing. And then it's as simple as swimming a lawnmower pattern over the reef area with your cameras on. So here you can see um, one of our restoration associates swimming the dual camera system over the reef and he's swimming uh, fairly high over the reef because this is a larger area that we are mosaicing and so we're less concerned about say sub millimeter level resolution and more concerned with getting a good stitch of a couple thousand square meters which would be very time intensive uh, and very physically demanding if we were to swim closer to the reef. So then our model construction uh, we use a fairly standard iMac desktop computer um, for our processing, it has a decent 4.2 gigahertz processor, um, only 32 gigabytes of RAM, 
and only the standard graphics card that you can get from the Apple Store. Um, for a couple of different reasons, we decided on this these specifications. One of them was um, the cost. So this computer is easily available for just north of $3,000. Uh, and it's also a computer that we can use at CRF for things other than photo mosaics. We can use it for uh, photography, editing, video editing, uh, as well as a number of other things. So it's not a, a single use dedicated photo mosaic computer for us. We also use uh, Agisoft Metashape, previously known as PhotoScan Pro. And because we are not, strictly speaking, an academic institution, it is significantly more expensive uh, than what Nicole quoted earlier. So for us, a single license runs $3,500. Um, so if you do have an academic institution, you're in luck because you can get it for a lot cheaper than that. Um, all told then, whoops, all told you're looking at about $8,000 uh, to get yourself off the ground when you factor in the costs of your cameras and your other various little materials that you need. This is what our uh, model construction looks like on the computer. This is the PhotoScan Pro uh, window. And you'll notice here that in this area, we have just over 1,800 uh, photographs that are aligned. And this area is covering almost 500 square meters. So on a one second interval camera, two cameras, this area took about 15 minutes um, to swim and acquire the in-water imagery. And then the model was stitched and aligned overnight on our computer. So we set it up, let it run, and we came in the next day and it was good to go. Right here shows uh, some of the different options that you have for uh, PhotoScan or Metashape as it's now called. Um, if you're doing a larger area of reef, like this project right here on the left is, uh, you can choose to break your reef area down into chunks and acquire uh, imagery for each chunk separately and then stitch the chunks together in uh, photo scan. So what you see here is uh, a series of images that were taken for an area of reef totaling about 2000 square meters. We broke it down into four smaller subsections, aligned some of those subsections in PhotoScan and then exported the ortho mosaics uh, into Photoshop where we use the Photoshop panorama function to get a final stitch. Now this is really handy because it does cut down on processing time. Um, PhotoScan is incredibly detailed and incredibly accurate and so building the 3D models from which you export a two-dimensional ortho mosaic takes some time if you have this many cameras and this large of an area. We found a way to circumvent this by exporting each chunk individually or smaller subsections individually and then aligning them in Photoshop. Now it's important to note that this doesn't give you that 3D model that Agisoft builds for you, but for CRF's purposes, when we're not concerned with the three-dimensionality of the reef and we only care about the two-dimensional projection, we can export and then align in Photoshop, which does this much, much quicker. On the right here, you'll notice the batch process window that Agisoft has. It allows you to set a specific script and then click OK and the project runs uh, until it has completed. So there's very little actual human uh, processing time required to get a good stitch once you've acquired the imagery. And then what we can do is we can generate uh, uh, images and graphics like this. So in the upper left portion of this box, you'll see a very large area of reef, approximately 2,000 square meters. And this area was imaged when there was no Acropora uh, on the reef. It was an area that we designated for future outplanting events. Down here in the bottom left corner, you'll see a sub transect or a sub area, a transect of this larger area that has elkhorn corals now planted on it and they are designated in clusters by these blue dots. We can then zoom in even further on smaller and smaller subsets until we zoom into the coral level and we can now identify our corals and begin the data extraction uh, procedure. So for data extraction, um, very quickly some background. At CRF, we outplant our corals typically in clusters of seven to 10 coral fragments. 
Uh, and then over time, those fragments grow, fuse together, and what we're left with are uh, sort of closely linked pockets of live coral on the reef. So when we go to extract these data from our images, we first load the exported JPEG or TIFF in Photoshop. So this is straight out of Agisoft, um, what our two-dimensional ortho mosaic looks like. And then in Photoshop, we can begin to build some layers on top of this. If you're familiar with Photoshop at all, um, this will look sort of familiar to you, I think. We build our layers uh, in, uh, with a couple different parameters in mind. So the first layer, typically what we'll do is we'll color correct the image just to make it look nice and pretty and also to help the corals pop a little bit. We'll then trace and color our scale bars and we will mark and label those coral clusters to help us get a sense of site orientation and where the corals are going to be. And then we'll zoom in on each cluster individually and actually trace and color the corals. So then this is what that looks like with a little bit of correction, the blue dots marking the coral, the red here on our scale bar. And from this, what we can do is export individual layers. So what this is showing is just the corals, which are colored in in white here and our red scale bar. We export these layers out of Photoshop as JPEGs and then we bring those images into image J, which is actually now called Fiji for some reason. Uh, but in image J, it's very easy to set your scale. So we know the length of the scale bar, obviously. We can convert pixels into centimeters or millimeters. And then using this layer here on the right half, that is just corals, we can measure all of the colored pixels. So what we've done so far in the last uh, year or so, we have completed eight photo mosaics of around 2,000 square meters prior to outplanting where there was no natural aquapora. And we have gone back to each of those eight areas and subsequently developed about 20 to 25 mosaics of around 500 square meters that show our outplanted corals, either immediately after outplanting, one month after outplanting, cases one year after outplanting. And these mosaics have been analyzed in tandem with the in-water divers conducting those uh, coral monitoring surveys and requirements that we've been subjected to uh, for the last few years. So with this, we've been able to compare the mosaic approach to the typical in-water fate tracking approach. And we found that the mosaics are able to locate each cluster very easily, measure individual corals within clusters, whether they are fused or not, differentiate between dead and living tissue with the same accuracy as our in-water divers. And also it gives us some new metrics. We're able to track the growth and movement of these individuals as they potentially fragment and reattach, as well as calculate area coverage of the population on the reef, which is a really crucial metric for what we're doing on the scale that we're doing it. And it's something that we just couldn't do in past years. Finally, our data curation and access is fairly straightforward. We use a, an external RAID 5 system that costs about $1,000. It's an external hard drive system with built-in redundancies. And we sort all of our uh, photos, all of our uh, Agisoft files, all of our exported mosaics, and the Photoshop files together in folders that are sorted by reef, by project, by uh, timestamp. There's really any number of ways that, that we can do this. We also save our image J measurements uh, and collect them into an Excel file that we can use uh, to easily export our data from. So with that, I would like to direct anyone that is interested to our website here where we have uh, just recently published our SOP. This link is also available through the Coral Restoration Consortium website now, I believe. And uh, I would also like to give a shout out here to Garrett Fundikowski, who was an intern with CRF and who helped with uh, the creation of this manual. So thanks very much. Great. Thank, thank you, Alex. Uh, that was terrific. Um, we have our next uh, uh, polling question. Uh, uh, we'd like to get some participation here. Uh, focusing on the step three of the pipeline, probably the where we think the most about. 
what type of ecological information is most important for your organization to collect? Please select all that apply. Coral cover, coral size structure, the health of an outplant, outplant survivorship, and outplant growth rate. You can click more than one. All right, I appreciate everybody staying engaged here. It's been a, a, a great lineup of, of presenters. Terrific, okay, thank you. Next up is Lisa Karn from the Fragments of Hope effort in Belize. Lisa's been a leader in uh, uh, challenging colleagues from universities, research institutes, and foundations to accelerate their efforts to make new technologies available to the coral restoration community. And I appreciate her efforts to find solutions and to push for more rapid advancements. And I appreciate you, Lisa, for being here today. Thank you for having me. Greetings from Belize, everybody. I'm trying to work the slide on this side. It might be my internet is a little bit slow. Um, the first few slides, I wanted to um, kind of bring it back to uh, restoration needs. We've been in this game for over 10 years. And as many of you know, uh, you get questions like, uh, well, you're, it's constantly an uphill battle. You know, does restoration even work? What kind of survivorship do you have? What kind of scale can you do it at? I'm not able to click here yet. But um, so we were first introduced to photo mosaics in 2014 and we began using them at Laughing Bird Key National Park. And hopefully I'll be able to show some of the results we're getting from that. I think something's happening now. Um, well, the first few slides I wanted to show you guys is what our motivation was for this. So it's pretty easy to measure survivorship and growth rates in a nursery, but that's not realistic, nor is talking about six months to a year survivorship for something like corals. So these images are showing you the type of coral cover that we have now at Laughing Bird Key and who's going to go out there and measure it. So a, another few examples I wanted to show is, um, you know, it's so difficult because they're, they grow in three dimensions, unlike a brain coral or a boulder coral. So I had, um, um, I think it was Justin Bauman at UNC just did a little sample. Of course, you can use image J on a single colony, but if you have hundreds or thousands, as Alex mentioned, it's not realistic. Also, you have storm events that spread things out. And I wanted to point out, for example, with the Acroporas, these are just some time series photographs of, you know, what kind of coverage we're getting and how do we measure it. Uh, with the Acroporids, before our last hurricane event, which was only a Cat 1 indirect, I could still kind of count the palmatas out there. But because pieces break off and naturally regrow back, we call them satellite pieces, you actually end up with more than you started. So how do you calculate that survivorship, right? So these are the motivations that we had for using photo mosaics. For the staghorn, even worse, some uh, time series here where we started with 40 little pieces on a rope outplanted in 2010. And today, that little rope, um, the whole stand there can't even fit in one single photo frame. So again, how do we talk about this? How do we measure success? How do we even quantify what we're seeing on the reef? Um, now, now we started recently using um, David Vaughn's modified methodology for microfragments doing direct outplanting. So it's kind of opposite. Instead of starting with few little pieces and getting many, we're starting with many little microfragments and wanting them to fuse and become, you know, colonies. So again, how do we talk about survivorship and measure this? So photo mosaics. We started in 2014 with four GoPros. It was the first time we had some decent funds. We were first introduced to um, Art Gleason and uh, this um, protocol in 2014. So that's why we began then. And I started on a tank, but as you can see in subsequent photographs, our sites are really shallow. We're focusing on fringing and reef crests. So the depths um, are quite different. And now I do most of these on snorkel. We also reduced the amount of GoPros. So we're currently using two GoPros and a single Nikon. And, um, the costing is fairly high, but again, as people have emphasized, uh, even if I'm just going to show you the basic coral cover data that I'm getting out of this, these photo mosaics exist and someone else can go back and look at benthic community changes over time from adding acroporids or 
sponges or whatever else they might want to look at. Um, I do want to mention though with the GoPro that we needed to buy the extra battery packs and it takes me about an hour to do each mosaic and I can only do two in one day because of the battery and or the memory card. Um, and I think I have a short video I wanted to share that just gives you an idea now, this is from last year, uh, you know, how, how, how shallow these sites are and um, offline you could message me and Art and I can give you some little tips that we've learned from some mistakes about uh, issues with the shallow, shallow depth. And then I'm gonna um, skip to the next slide, I hope. So this is at Laughing Bird Key National Park. Before I forget, I'd like to invite you all to come see us in person. So uh, this, I, I don't do the processing. I'm lucky enough to have Art Gleason, so I'm constantly finding couriers to send up these hard drives I have over the place because I load up my hard drives and ship them out. So instead, I'm going to tell you how we set this up and what results we have since 2014 at Laughing Bird Key. So going from left to right, 24 and 2013 on the top up there, those were the only two sites or plots that were unplanted when we first began the mosaic protocol. 20 and 21 were planted about eight months prior to the first time we mosaic them, and sites 9 and 13 were planted in 2010. So they were already, you know, covered in corals. From now on, in all of our new sites, we're doing the, the mosaics before we plant, so we can really track things over time. We have the leeward and the windward side, and we also have what we hope to be able to compare in the long run is, um, for example, this is a fully protected no-take zone. We have control sites that are in unprotected areas, and now we're expanding to more fore reef sites and back reef sites on the main barrier reef. So why I'm so thrilled that we're doing this webinar is I'm hoping that this, this, this protocol can be used as a way to standardize our restoration results, not only within Belize, but across the Caribbean, so we have a better way of talking about what we're achieving out there. I just want to, there's a lot of information on this table it has the dates of outplant and what was outplanted i just want to point to site nine here that um only had 209 fragments when i did the math it's like less it's like two fragments per meter squared because one of the things we often talk about as practitioners is you know what type of density should we be planting these corals at and also for us kind of what is the minimum that we can put out there so we can move on to other sites because you have some saying you know restoration is never done and then we have other, others saying, you know, what kind of coral cover are we aiming for, et cetera, et cetera. So on this site nine, you can see with 200 little, little pieces of staghorn, uh, in eight years later, that turned into 36% of 39% total cor coral cover. So that's pretty impressive, I think. Um, this is an example, you've seen examples already of what the mosaics look like. We use quadrants um, and th those are measured and there's also a calibration grid I didn't show that we do each time before we uh, swim the mosaics. In 2014, Brooke Gintar um, compared the use of the polygon or the digitizing the, the method there versus CPCE for coral coverage. And they were close enough that for us, we went with CPCE. It's a free um, software from Nova, I believe and uh, it's fairly user-friendly. Um, it may not be, you know, again, these mosaics exist out there, so if we want to go back and get more information other than just the coral cover, we can always do that. So the results, again, um, from left to right, 24 and 2013 were unplanted when we first began the mosaics. The years are color-coded, 2014 to 2018. So that jump um, on the left side from 24 to 23 from uh, red to orange, that's sort of obvious because we planted corals out there, but on the other sites, 20, 21, 9, and 13, that jump from red to orange that I've circled here is all natural growth in one year. We did not add any more corals to these sites and we don't add any corals to our mosaic sites because we want to track the natural, um, what's going on naturally. The dip you see in the yellow bar, that was 2016, we had a Hurricane Earl, a Cat 1 that passed indirectly and yet it flattened some of our sites. And look at the growth afterwards, which is really kind of what we've been seeing in the nurseries and what people that are familiar with the acropores have been calling pruning vigor. When we harvest the corals, they grow back faster. And so obviously we know they're adapted to high wave energy and a minor disturbance that's not catastrophic seems to actually promote growth. Again, the yellow to the green to the blue, we're not adding any corals on these sites. That is all natural growth, these corals spreading out and, and just growing. 
So I can't emphasize enough what a powerful tool the mosaics have been for us for restoration because prior to having this tool, I had no way to quantify you know, what was happening on the reef. And again, this is an example you can go and look at you know, by coral species. If you don't believe me, I can share the website with you. You guys can do your own annotation or come see us in person. And you can see that um, this, this site here that was outplanted in December 2010, so this data would have been four and a half years on the reef, and we already had almost 35% aquaporids from about, you know, maybe a thousand pieces put out there. So, you know, without the mosaics, all I had was these time series photos, which are sometimes very impressive, but they certainly aren't quantitative. And again, I did a little math here. When I look back, this is the site that has over 50% coral cover now from 2010. And when, uh, you know, we didn't specifically put four fragments per meter squared, but when I do the math, that's what it came out to. So my friend and colleague, Dave Vaughn, likes to say, you know, if he's got a new organization, plant a million corals. And while I agree, they don't have to be in the same place. And I think this is a powerful tool for us as restoration practitioners to start to tease out, given the right site selection, sort of how few, how few effort we can put in so we can get to more sites, if that makes sense. Um, and this last slide um, is showing, again, just the change in coral cover and the circled um, 21 is the image on the left there. And again, how else would I quantify this? You know, a, um, a typical um, line transect wouldn't do it justice. So I, I really can't emphasize enough how great this tool has been for us and we've been lucky to have art do our processing because you know we can't afford at this moment um the large machinery to actually do the, the processing i'm not sure how much longer he'll want to do that so that's why i'm hoping a bunch of us will have this need and we can figure out how to have a central place that processes um many of our mosaics so we can all work together and uh, share information and those are just some of our funders I wanted to flash and, and thank. Thank you, Lisa. That, that's excellent. Uh, for the, the community out there, we have one last uh, mid poll or mid uh, webinar question uh, asking about your perceptions of photo mosaics. Which step of the photo mosaic pipeline remains most intimidating for you? the image acquisition, model construction, step three, data extraction, step four, data curation and access, or none, I'm ready to do this. Okay, thank you for participating in this. Uh, there will be, you please, Click here. This will be the last of the, the in uh, presentation uh, polling questions. There will be three exit poll questions. If you're willing to participate, we would very much appreciate that. Okay, uh, I want to thank all the panelists for participating. Uh, this has been an excellent webinar. Um, I want to just remind you all that the goal of this webinar was to demystify some of the technology of photo mosaics in the efforts to monitor coral reefs. Uh, the technology is robust and it's available and it's here today and it provides a way for us to standardize how we look at coral reefs it en enables information exchange in a way that's very palpable and uh, honest and uh, bias free or at least with limited bias and allows us to archive what things look like today so that we can compare what things look like tomorrow at this point we just need to work together to assure that all of us who are interested in the technology have access. And I want to show you that every panelist here is committed to that goal. With that, I hand the microphone back over to Shay, and I want to thank uh, you, Shay, and the rest of the, the CRC, RN monitoring working group uh, for making this possible. Thanks, Stuart. And um, I'd like to thank the speakers um, on behalf of the CRC and the monitoring working group, and thank you all for tuning in today. Um, thanks also to those of you who participated in the survey about two months ago to help guide the content for this presentation. Don't forget this webinar has been recorded and will be available via the Coral Restoration Consortium website. Um, as you guys have seen, there are many potential applications of photo mosaics in coral reef monitoring and for restoration. Even better, collect your first photo mosaic imagery before you restore. 
so that you can illustrate a solid um, restoration success story. So I'd like to now open up the webinar for questions. Remember that you can either send me your question via the question box or raise your hand and I'll call on you. Um, and before we get going, um, note that after the webinar, we encourage you to continue the conversation on the Reef Resilience Network Discussion Forum, which is an online interactive community of coral reef managers and practitioners from around the world. As you can see on this, this slide, you can go to reefresilience.org, click on the network tab, or go to the link displayed on the screen to log in or join. Any questions we don't have time to get to today will be posted um, in the Coral Restoration Consortium group under the Groups tab. Uh, one question I'd like to kick us off with that we got um, written down was, um, to the speakers, are any of you all aware of anyone considering providing processing, curation, and hosting services for a fee? This is this is Art. I'll jump in uh, on that. I um, I don't know that I'm aware of like a company that does that, but I think we I certainly do collaborate with people like. Lisa, for example, um, and and do that sort of thing on a sort of project by project basis. Um, and I hope I think it's it's definitely an objective of of ours to build that out and make it more of a a larger scale um, operation. We're definitely actively looking for people who could collaborate on looking for funding to do that on a bigger scale. Um, and uh, you know, would definitely appreciate um, anyone who's listening to this webinar expressing their interest in such a thing because it will help us uh, uh, document the need for such a um, service. Um, you know, as we go forward, looking for a way to make it happen. Yeah, and let me just second Art's, this is Stuart here, just second Art's point here is that uh, we, we um, through individual collaborations, I think each one of us has uh, encountered individuals interested in participating. And uh, I think you've noted, uh, question asker and rest of community, that um, there's a strong economy of scale. I think that we all are going to gain more by doing this at scale uh, if it's uh, shared upon standardized techniques. So. Appreciate the question, and as Art points out, please share your perspective on this. If you are interested in some approaches where we can standardize and we can centralize, I think that there's that's a terrific way forward for the community. Think of it as an analog of sequencing facilities. Thanks, everyone. Uh, anything else to add before we move to the next question? Okay, um, I'm gonna go to Rahi Soren. Um, who was, had his hand raised or, and see if there's a question that, that you're unmuted. Hello, am I audible? Yes. Oh yeah, I would like to ask that uh, I would like to collaborate with someone working in the Andamans and the Indian Sea, Indian Ocean. Oh, uh, okay, so again, this is this is Art speaking. I um I, I can say that you know maybe as a bridge between uh, well I, more than a bridge the the for over uh, ten years now um, uh -huh. I've been working with people around the world um, to get the data processed, get the get the metrics extracted, um, get the information used and archived. But really, um, the efficient way to do this is to have people who are local in a given um, location, like at your site in the Indian Ocean, you know, we need to get you trained to collect the data. And then if you can do that part, then um, there's, there's definitely a way to get the data uh, uh, processed for you or get you over the hump to do it yourself if you want to do that, um, and really probably we should have a um, maybe an offline conversation about the sp specifics of your situation. But in general, uh, we've been very successful with people 
around the world, Lisa is a good example, you know, who collect the data and then forward it for um, assembly and 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 construction into a mosaic. Um, it, yes, thank again, you, thank I, you. Yeah. yeah, does that make sense? I don't think I don't think yeah. right now during question and answer we should work out the details of that, but let's Yeah, I think I can you know a meal later on. Yeah. Yep. Yeah, thank you. Great, thank you. Um, we've got another question uh, in the question box for Alex and Lisa. Have either of you used your photo mosaics to measure change in structural complexity over time uh, as a result of your restoration efforts? I guess I'll go ahead and jump in there first. Um, to this point, CRF hasn't really looked at increases in structural complexity. Um, the main reason for that is just because we're relatively new to this game. Um, the corals that we're mosaicing and monitoring have only been on the reef for uh, you know 18 months at the longest. And so in that amount of time, we haven't seen uh, a significant level of increase in structural complexity that would show up in our photo mosaic procedure. So remember I said our procedure uh, is a little bit lower scale resolution um, as, as written. And so the changes that we've seen in those last 12 to 18 months in our corals wouldn't necessarily be rendered in the final mosaic output. Now what we could in theory do, but just haven't to this point is go to individual colonies um, and mosaic them with a slightly different procedure that uses um, maybe you know an SLR camera to create a much higher resolution three-dimensional model and measure off of that. Um, but again, back to the point that the, the scale that we're operating at, we're not necessarily concerned with the individual colony. So to this point, it hasn't really been um, super valuable for us to look at individuals in that sense. Now, you know, hopefully in some at some point down the road, our restoration sites will grow to the point that they are significantly changing the, the three-dimensional complexity of the reef in a way that, that is viewable um, with our lower resolution mosaics. And at that point, I think we would become very interested in, in how corals are growing in, in three-dimensional space. Lisa, I don't know if you have anything to add on top of that. And just as an example, you uh, t for the time series, there is very strong opportunity to, to do a lot of diagnostics of measuring. Uh, Nicole showed a time series. We can send links to these uh, various time series. The technology is very amenable for tracking individual colony growth. Uh, and um, uh, it's a, it, there's a lot of robustness there. Great, thanks guys. Um, we've got a couple questions on georeferencing and I'm just gonna mash them together. One person wants to know if the data can be made available in a GIS format and someone else wants to know um, whether you can recommend a protocol for georeferencing the mosaic plot setup and the type of ground control points you use. Oh, I, I can take a quick stab at this if if you want, the, um, as Art pointed out, there are um, multiple forms of uh, geo-referencing. Uh, the highest technology uh, is going to be trying to get proper GPS uh, referencing for every photograph that goes in. Some AUVs have this ability uh, using the, um, uh, the underwater uh, GPS units, but these are a you know, big cost addition. Uh, there are approximate georeferencing capabilities that are viable uh, using good um, uh, control points and uh, angles taken, so you have bearings of the plot. Uh, there's great internal referencing from Mosaic. So if you have, a, a, you know, a formally two or more points well referenced, or even one point that's that's within a meter and you have a good angle, you can drop it down onto a uh, onto a map. Uh, how you then take these uh, uh, these points and now this scaled model uh, and apply it onto a, a global map depends upon your approach forward. The Esri products, the um, ArcGIS, et cetera, does provide a lot of layers where you can get uh, good um, geo-referencing. 
but I, I will say that unless you're using uh, some of the high-end um, uh, navigational uh, and communication underwater you know, efforts of, of georeferencing every image, you're getting a, a approximate georeferencing, but that approximate georeferencing can be very reasonably within a meter or so on the planet. Yeah, I'll just add that um, I've done uh, uh, several techniques, um, just like Stuart said, dropping these mosaics into um, either ArcGIS or even Google Earth or Google Maps, and, and it works very well. Um, the, I'll second his point, though, that the internal accuracy, the, the spatial accuracy within the area of the mosaic itself will be um, much higher than the absolute accuracy of where these things are positioned in space. I mean, again, we're not talking like, you know, giant errors, but, you know, you're limited by your GPS to however accurate that is, which is usually on the order of meter meters. Thanks, guys. Um, one other question on the question forum is, is there any way to use this to monitor stony coral tissue loss disease? We just um, returned from an expedition uh, working with colleagues from Moat, Woods Hole, Ocean X, and some other partners uh, doing photo mosaic imagery in the Florida Keys. Happy to talk more about the details, but one of the core efforts was to image different sections of the Florida Keys capturing this disease and the spatial ecology of it. It was very successful. Uh, the, the types of corals that are most affected by this disease are very amenable to large area, to photo mosaics. Uh, we were able to capture areas that were in the midst of an outbreak, uh, ones that had, had recently gone through it where it looked like a fire, a fire had passed through, but it was obviously disease. And we could look for uh, patterns of uh, potential survivorship and growth of partial colony and then we have some baselines of areas it's going into. That's a terrific question and tracking the before, during, and after the spatial ecology of disease spread uh, is a terrific use of photo mosaics. The answer in short is yes. Great. Just to piggyback on that real quickly, um, what Stuart said, uh, CRF has also had a lot of success sort of accidentally <laughs> with that sort of thing. Uh, we haven't necessarily been looking for it, but because we go out and take, uh, you know, imagery uh, in some cases is in as near a time scale as a month, we can see, you know, progression of disease on other corals in, in the reef, um, not just our outplants. And another sort of related um, thing that Lisa touched on briefly in her talk was that this is really, really useful when it comes to um, hurricanes, large and small. Uh, CRF was fortunate enough to be just developing our mosaic technology about a month before Hurricane Irma hit the Keys, and we were able to mosaic some of our sites then before and after the hurricane. And so you can look at uh, a lot of different metrics related to hurricane disturbances as well as disease progressions with this technology. Great point. Um, one additional question online is a methodological question. How well do the surface lawnmower methods work on high rugosity reefs where there may be overhangs? Do the lawnmower patterns need to be supplemented with spot photos or is the lawnmower pattern alone largely sufficient, thinking mostly of spur and groove formations? Uh, so I'll pitch in here. Uh, when we first started using this technology, we actually didn't even know about the 3D pipeline and we were just doing that double lawnmower. And it actually is pretty good at capturing more of that 3D structure than you would expect. Um, just because of that, especially with the wide angle lens, you do start to see the sides of things as you start to get to the edge of the photo. Um, since we've been transitioning or since we transitioned to the 3D imaging method, we do kind of augment our imaging, especially in more complex areas where you just um, kind of as you're swimming, just make a mental note of where more of these complex features are and just go back um, and kind of just tilt the camera a little bit to the side um, so that you can capture the sides of those overhangs or even kind of go a little bit under. 
but you do want to be careful about um, in the imagery if you have some that have a lot of that blue water in the background or areas where um, you do get that light attenuation where there are features on the bottom that look more blue because they're further away in the image. It can kind of mess with the model reconstruction uh, where you get uh, some of this like blue sheen over some of the areas. So you just want to make sure that you minimize that. Um, and really the best way is just to get closer to those areas so that you reduce kind of the, the broad um, footprint of that image. Thanks. Um, one other question on the questions forum. How about mosaics and turbid water areas? Have you had any luck with that? Uh, this is Art speaking. I can I can tell you we've tried. Okay, turbidity, turbidity, turbidity at some point will be a limit to this. Okay, I mean if you absolutely can't see the bottom, um, you're not getting, going to be able to image it, and you're not going to be able to make a mosaic. Having said that, I have done uh, a lot of mosaics in in reasonably poor visibility you know, um, like meters, uh, and, and, and had very good results. Um, it, the cameras really make a difference here, actually. You can do a lot with, with uh, SLR imagery to increase contrast, to sharpen uh, data that is otherwise compromised by low vis, and, um, and I've found that that helps immensely in those situations. Um, so I can't give you a, an absolute, uh, you know, threshold uh, because it will probably it will depend on lighting and turbidity and all sorts of factors like that. But you can I can say you can uh, you can get good results in in remarkably uh, poor conditions. You also want to consider too that as your visibility decreases, your lawnmower pattern is going to become more and more suspect. So things like uh, compasses and very sort of pragmatic approaches to your swim pattern are going to be really helpful. You can't just swim, you know, line of sight if your visibility is is down to two or three meters. Um, it's certainly handy when you have that visibility because it sort of simplifies everything. But to ensure you're getting the, the overlap you need. Um, compasses and and floats marking the corners of your area or the lines you're swimming um, really almost become a necessity. Great, thanks guys. I am sorry to have to wrap up the question and answer session. We have lots of great questions that we didn't get to unfortunately, um, but our time is up. Again, this webinar has been recorded and will be available on the CRC webpage. And we encourage you to continue the conversation on the Reef Resilience Network discussion forum shown here on the slide, which is, again, an interactive online community of coral reef managers and practitioners from around the world. So let's keep the conversation going. Thank you all so much for your time.